I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Larry Hancock, a well-known UAP researcher, author, and board member of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Larry brings his formal training in history and cultural anthropology to his research and writing on Cold War history and national security subjects. He's a graduate of the University of New Mexico, where he earned his BA with honors, majoring in history, cultural anthropology, and education. Following his service in the United States Air Force, his career in computer, communications, and technology marketing allowed him the opportunity to become involved in and consult on strategic analysis and planning studies. Larry is the author of seven books on topics in national defense and UFO history and joins us today to discuss his new paper on the UAP nuclear correlation. So, Larry, welcome. And let me thank you for your service as well. I always do that for former service members. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's great to be with you and I appreciate the thanks. Uh, that, that is that's certainly nice to hear, even after a, a long time ago. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, and for you, I guess that the struggle continues because so many of your books are on the Cold War and uh, you've written on espionage, you've written on uh, security and tactics. I mean, there's a lot of strategic stuff related to the military that you've written on. So this is something that you're definitely engaged with as well as the UAP issue. Um, so it, today we're discussing a new paper you co-authored through the SCU entitled UAP Pattern Recognition Study, 1945 to 1975, U.S. Military Atomic Warfare Complex. It's kind of a mouthful, so I'll put a link in the YouTube <laughs> notes for it. Um, so what inspired you to write this paper? Well, actually, and, and you're right, that if I were doing this in marketing, I would not have used that title. It, it's a little little bit long. Um, actually, it's an outgrowth of the earlier work that I did in my national security and intelligence studies. It, it kind of, I have been involved or at least following the UFO UAP phenomena for decades, uh, since, since the years of APRO and NICAP and back into the 60s. But it was the more recent work on national security, and in particular, my exposure to, to something called strategic intelligence, threat and warnings intelligence, and the practices and, and techniques of that that persuaded me to re-enter the subject and take a look at it from an, a, a more pure intelligence perspective, which led to my book, Unidentified, which deals with the, pro the problem from an intelligence project and kind of brought the tools and model and practices into play that when I joined SCU, I decided, well, here's an opportunity. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can do this on a larger scale than I did in the book and build a team and really approach this in a comprehensive, rigorous. So that, that's kind of, it started from national security, went through the book and ended up with SCU. <laughs> Ah, okay, okay. Well, I, I think that this is incredibly relevant and very timely, right? I mean, as everyone knows, the UAP issue is making headlines on almost a daily basis at this point. And one of the things that Lou Elizondo has publicized recently is this idea that UAP are often sighted near nuclear facilities. And this is something that I've seen correlated reports with uh, basically across the entire nuclear supply, supply chain. I mean, this goes from like nuclear medical facilities to weapon storage, distribution, production, I mean, everything. So in your study, you guys focused on the military. Uh, can I ask why that was? Well, for one thing, we, we decided we would take a very broad look at, at the spectrum of what had been going on, especially from a historical standpoint. Uh, and many of the first earliest reports and best reports actually come out of the military and in particular from the early atomic facilities, the radioactive material plants at Hanford and Los Alamos and the assembly, the assembly plants and the stockpiles. So since those were such a good source of early information, that's where we decided to start. But as, as you said, we broadened it out and, and covered both the atomic weapons complex, the deployed weapons, we covered the conventional military bases, and went on through 
uh, stockpile sites, nuclear energy sites, basically covering the entirely military slash atomic complex, if you will. Yeah. Well, and again, incredibly relevant. You know, in my own research, one of the things that surprised me was um, back before Roswell in 1947, there were sightings over Hanford in 1945 as a production facility. And then I believe Jacques Vallée also talked about sightings near the Trinity test site, right? So, I mean, this goes back to the very beginning of the UFO, UFO phenomenon, really. It goes well back, and it's a surprise, a surprise in a way, before the explosion of the first atomic bombs, atomic weapons, the a test or bombs. And of course, many people have postulated that that, that might draw attention you know, yeah. obviously an atomic explosion. But one of the interesting things and actually surprising things we found when we started going back through the records were that the sightings at Hanford, for example, began during construction, well before uh, any radioactive materials were actually extracted, well before, uh, you know, any particulates were. So actually something was going on with the uh, a look at atomic weapons development before most people would expect it, I guess. And I, I think that's that's pretty significant. Okay. Well, and if it's okay, let me go off my questions a second and, and focus in on that because so I'm one of those people. One of the things that I'd wondered, just I'd, I'd put this out there before, was um, radioactive materials emit neutrinos and we can't really shield those neutrinos. So my thought had been, well, maybe the UAP are seeing the neutrinos and it's kind of like a flashlight. So there's an interest there. But what you're saying is the interest in these facilities basically dates back before they had any radioactive or fissile materials on hand. Now, is that something that you've seen in multiple facilities? Um, it's most obvious at Hanford. Uh, you do see some of it at Oak Ridge. Um, I, I think one of and it's there's always a danger of, you know, projecting what you know onto the phenomena that you're studying, but we know a good deal about how you determine what's going on in atomic weapons development. For example, the United States conducted extensive surveys, particulate collections. They knew how to see whether or not atomic weaponry, in particular concentrations of fissile material, were being developed through photographic studies because it takes a certain concentration of power. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to have lots of power. You've got to have, we did it with immense dams in Tennessee and outside Hanford and Washington. You know, so there are things that you can look for physically. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to wait until the piles start producing. You don't have to wait until the extraction starts. So a combination of knowing what to look for in terms of energy consumption, as, as well as then looking at particulate matter, uh, not nutrient, not, not even that, going down and doing water samples and air samples, we were able to actually locate, the U.S. was able to locate the development sites for the Russian weapons, the Indian weapons, the Chinese weapons, before they ever exploded bombs. So if we could do that with the technology of the time, obviously it could be done with our own atomic development as well. It's, it's something we even know how to do. <laughs> In, interesting interesting well and again the thing that interests me the most about this is it seems like it may hint at intent a little bit but uh, now in terms of the report you worked with 590 ua re, uap reports across uh radiative materials from again production plants assembly facilities control sites um the entire nuclear weapons supply chain there um what were some of the most interesting findings in your report? I think it was the pattern recognition that really triggered it because kind of the start in this model, the start in this process is, you know, collect the data and then look to see if you find anything anomalous. You know, don't, don't impose anything on the data. Just write it down, put it in a database, study it and see what emerges. And one of the things that we found was, we found about three things that were, particularly anomalous. First of all, we found discrete windows of elevated UAP activity at the earliest sites. 
but those windows only lasted for a period of time, three, four years, and then it's done. The levels drop. As a matter of fact, they not only drop, they disappear, which is, which is a fascinating, that's, that's, that's anomalous. You wouldn't expect that to happen. We found that occurring at the materials plants. So they start, they continue, then they drop off. Interestingly enough, the other part of that is when a next generation of plants come online, like Savannah River comes online in the early 50s, there's no repeat. Nothing happens at Savannah level, Savannah River on the level of what happened at Hanford or Oak Ridge. Uh, we found the same thing at the weapons assembly plants. Uh, Los Alamos, Sandia Base, again, a window of intense activity. Yet when the Pantex plant comes online in Amarillo a few years later, nothing comparable. So the fact that these windows of activity exist is, is, is anomalous. The fact that they go away is anomalous. The third thing is that the attention, the elevated activity seems to jump in time and other windows occur. For example, another window occurred when we deployed the first ICBMs, the Atlas and Titan missiles, were back to an elevated level of activity at those locations. No longer at the first locations, you know, it's not that that restarts, it's just where the missiles are. And then finally, the last thing we see is when we start deploying multiple independently delivered warheads on Minuteman 3s, we see a burst of activity there, nowhere else. So those sorts of patterns really stop you and make you think because there are windows and there are transitions. And both those suggest that there's something organized and focused going on. Okay. And also that seems to answer a later question that I had about something that I've heard called sensor bias, which might be similar in some ways to confirmation bias. This idea that there's heightened security at nuclear facilities. And therefore, you know, you've got more guards, more cameras, more people on high alert, and they know that what they're guarding is important. You're going to have more people reporting anomalies, right? And from what you're saying, if if it was something like sensor bias, that would be consistent. You just have more UFO reports around these facilities. But what you're saying is you have windows, especially when new technologies are deployed and that seems like it goes against like this this simple bias question i guess yeah yeah there's there's no reason that, the, that those people would stop seeing what they were seeing before unless it actually stopped you know it's like in fact if anything they'd be more sensitized so you would and and one of the things we also noticed is there's no correlation between these elevated activities at our study sites and the national waves. In fact, that was rather striking. It's kind of like when there's this huge national wave of UFO reports in 1952, it doesn't restart those earlier study site activities. There's no burst there. Uh, but and your question's very good and very appropriate because it did concern us. One of the things that we did to try to counter that is we selected a series of control sites that we could use as reference against the study sites. And one set of sites specifically were air defense bases. And these are air defense bases with surveillance radars, interceptors, you know, their primary mission is detecting UFOs and responding to them. Okay, so if, if you're talking about sensitivity, they would actually be more sensitive to UFOs per se than the atomic sites. Atomic sites are particularly sensitive to ground level intrusion, you know, spies, infiltrate, whatever. Um, and we were somewhat surprised to the, definitely the controls did not show anywhere near the same pattern of activity that the study sites did, the atomic sites did. So that was another measure that we instituted to try to compensate for the, the sensitivity bias that you're talking about, because we did sort of expect that, but it turned out not to be there. Yeah, yeah. Well, so one thing, this question is a little bit less focused, perhaps, but this kind of occurred to me that this period of time, 1945 to 1975, was incredibly transitional in American society. And 
I'm wondering, did you see any change in the nature of reported sightings? I mean, other than these bursts of intense activity that you've already mentioned, you know, did you see kind of a change over time? And the reason that I, I ask that is um, I know that like the types of craft reported by the American public, right, started out with flying saucers. Um, you know, for quite a while, we had black triangles. You know, now people are seeing uh, like these Tic Tac devices. Um, it seems to to change in trends. I was wondering if you kind of picked up on any of that. We are looking at that separately. As a matter of fact, SCU has a separate study that's going through peer review right now. Uh, myself and Robert Powell and a team worked on that, dealing with shapes, speeds, maneuvers, that sort of thing, and looking for trends over time. Uh, and and somewhat surprisingly, it doesn't change as much as you might expect. There are two or three standard shapes. But one of the things that's fascinating is over the full spectrum up to contemporary times, regardless of the shape of the object, regardless of how aerodynamic or non-aerodynamic it might be, all of these objects have the ability to accelerate, decelerate, uh, G-loading, immense G loading, hundreds of Gs, uh, maneuver. So it's that does not vary over the entire period of time that we can see. They had the same capability in 1947 that they have in 2020, you know, and, and, and it has nothing to do with shape, which is, is surprising. But within the intention study, we are, we're looking at a couple of elements separate than that along the line of your question. One is the fact that, for example, groups and formations of UAPs. Was there any change in that? And and actually, as it turns out, there's a major change over time. Early on, um, large formations, groups, uh, integrated activities where the UAPs are interacting with each other, even at formation or timing, something like that, very common over a period of time. Uh, very common to find that occurring during the day daylight. Then after a period of time, I won't call it a window, but after a period of time, that transitions to no more formation flights. You, you don't find that anymore. You don't find, you don't see daylight formations of UAPs at, like you saw in 1947 or 1950 or 1953. You just don't see that anymore. What you find are a lot more nighttime reports and individual object reports and a lot more close encounter reports. Mm -hmm. So there definitely are trends over time that are outside the purely military domain and more the, the public domain. And we're just starting to take a look at that in, in our database uh, because it does extend it a bit beyond the military. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, your focus was on land-based encounters. But the U.S. Navy has also reported encounters with submarines, right? And those submarines have nuclear weapons on board. And uh, I, I'm not sure how many or how often those encounters happen. And then there's this larger, uh, you know, I, I guess, question of things like the Nimitz Carrier Group, right? Where you have nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and, and nuclear-powered vehicles, and they are encountering UAP. So, again, this, this correlation is striking. You know, but from what you're saying, it tends to be primarily focused on weapons, I guess. It, yes, we did. We did expand the study uh, to take a look. We did look at UFO reports at, at atomic power plants, so non-military, non-weapon. But we did take a look at the Navy as best we could. We looked at the carriers that atomic powered. Interestingly enough, almost all the super carriers were atomic powered, and almost all of them carried atomic bombs used by fighter uh, fighter bomber groups and actually cruise missiles up until the late 70s into the 80s when they were removed theoretically all removed but so for a long period of time you had atomic propulsion and atomic weapons together the interesting thing is we've tried to look at that there are virtually no official reports coming out of the Navy, one of the real problems we face is the Navy has always been very bad at reporting outside the Navy 
you know, they're, they're not sharing with the Air Force. They're not sharing with Project Blue. The Coast Guard was good. They shared with Project Blue, but not so much the Navy. So we can pick up a few incidents, um, some, you know, actually some non-nuclear carriers had a fairly noticeable body of UAP incidents, radar tracks, attempted interceptions over short bursts of time. Um, but there's nothing there. There's nothing there like the other areas that we're studying, but we don't know that is true because of the way the Navy reported it. In our report, we note that there are a couple of holes. One hole is the Navy, which we, we don't know. Even today, with the new DOD rules, we, we only now know that the Navy may have reinstituted a reporting system. We don't know that they ever had a reporting system uh, comparable to the Air Force. And the Atomic Energy Commission, which operated the first stockpile sites, apparently had no reporting system at all. There was never any reporting system for atomic power plants. So even though we can pick up a handful of reports, they're all anecdotal. Yeah. And they weren't investigated. And you know that, that's a real problem for the study. It just, we had to say those are holes. Uh, I will say that we did take a look at all of the commercial power plants, atomic power plants. And aside from a handful of anecdotal reports in newspapers, there's nothing comparable in the atomic power network as compared to the weapons network. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I want to mention a couple of books here that I think support your report. One of them is Robert Hastings' UFOs and Nukes. This has become a classic. I'd never heard of this before two years ago. And now pretty much everyone that I talk with on UAP is like, oh, yeah, yeah, UFOs and Nukes. So there was that. And then uh, Robert Salas, Faded Giant, um, where he's talking about Malmstrom, right? And and do these align, I guess, with uh, the conclusions in your paper, your findings? And they do. We took a, to, there's an, a third book called Clear Intent uh, that's actually an excellent book and takes a, a broader look of the mili at the military incidents in the 70s than, than uh, Salas' book. Actually, they, they really do an in-depth job of looking at National Military Command Center reports and NORAD reports, and we use that heavily. Uh, we, so we did do, we did Use Salas book and clear intent. The certainly familiar with Hastings. The problem with the Hastings book, which is kind of where we we set ourselves apart a little bit, is that Robert collected a lot of information anecdotally, decades after the fact. That, that it it's troublesome and that the a lot of these are incidents from military personnel or personnel on military bases that they didn't report. Now, the thing about that is a lot of military people did report, you know, incidents at, at the same time. So you get into a quandary of dealing with anecdotal reports. And we we chose really to go with official reports, both from the military and law enforcement. We started out, you, you mentioned, you know, we ended up with almost 600 reports that we looked at in this database, but we started off with 2,000 some. And you know, filtered those down to what we thought were the hardcore. So it, regardless of all that, the, the point is, yes, there's a great correlation in a focus on atomic weapons. And I think a focus on not just, just looking at them from a distance, but especially Clear Intent and Solace Book document a, a series of intrusions and intrusive activities and security violations, things that are things that go beyond the pale, and in a sense, because if you're just doing in, intelligence collection, you don't necessarily want to be seen. Yeah. But if you choose to hover 50 feet over the atomic weapons storage bunker on a sack base, you kind of telegraphing your presence, and you know. So there's some interesting applications into those kind of intrusions, especially low-level intrusions um, at the ICM bases and the SAC bases. Well, let me ask about intent, I guess. Um, do these intrusions appear hostile 
or does it appear to be more just curiosity? And I also want to ask, um, are, are these intrusions becoming more frequent over time? Yeah. I'll have to put off just a little bit on that question because we actually, since we just published our pattern recognition study, we have our intention study and peer review. Mm, and, okay. and SCU is very rigorous. It's kind of like, okay, guys, you, you claim this to be a rigorous formal study. We need to have it peer reviewed. We need to have it academically edited. We do have an intention study that we have completed. And we looked at four levels. Uh, we looked at something innocuous like a survey all the way through preemption down to intervention. And we took the patterns and we combined them with indicators, if you will, activities that would indicate one over the other. We weighted them, we go through a matrix calculation and, and we do come, we, we profile them. What is most likely, what is least likely, which is standard intentions practice. This these techniques are not science. They are intelligence. They're assessments. That's the best you ever get. It's kind of like, okay, you're reporting to your boss and you go, okay, this looks like the most probable. You don't say, absolutely, this is this is what it is, boss, because it's it's not it's not replicable. You know, this is not scientific data. You can't do it over again and see what it looks like. You know, um, but so we are, we hope to have that report published this year and to, to rank out those probabilities. But yeah, we are we are tackling intentions, absolutely, okay. and, and going out on a limb in that regard, but it's kind of only out on the limb to the extent the data is behind us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I will definitely wait for that one to come out. And again, just to put a plug in for the SCU, uh, the website is explorescu.org. Again, that's explorescu.org. I would urge everyone viewing this to visit the website and learn more about what you guys do. Um, I have done so many interviews with people who have written for the SCU. I, I think that the work that is being done there is just heads and tails more rigorous, incredible than anything else out there. So, um, you know, I, I also want to ask about a, an idea from Dr. Yeaman Ansbro, um, who is a researcher in, I believe, Ireland. And he has suggested, based on his own research, that the Earth is under controlled surveillance by UAP. Those are his words. I'm wondering, do you think that these nuclear intrusions could be part of a plan to gauge our nuclear capabilities or measure our response times? Uh, certainly our study of, of the U.S. military suggests that is true. I mean, the fact we just talked about the fact that it, it appears that something was in play even before we built our first pile, before we ran our first processing plant, before we exploded our first test weapon. It it it's suggestive that there was some sort of ongoing surveillance, and and you know it it didn't just it didn't start after the first bomb explosion, you know it was it was in place enough so that it something triggered you know some some construction, perhaps the, the first pile in Chicago, something triggered a surveillance that was already in place. And I will say what, what we're seeing, and, and you asked the question about whether or not this is ongoing. Uh, it would appear that this surveillance in the military domain, now there, obviously there's a public domain and that could be studied and other things can be, but within the military domain, it appears that this this surveillance is cyclical. The surveillance itself may be ongoing, but the the monitoring and the, the close-up survey uh, appears to be cyclical when new systems are deployed, not so much new weapons. I mean, a hydrogen weapon is a hydrogen weapon, but when you put it on a different type of aircraft, when you put it on a type of missile, when you put many of them on the same missile, we see a pattern of revisit, you know, that it's, so it seems that someone, some intelligence, because this certainly indicates organization and intelligence is, is conducting a surveillance that is triggered in particular by different, different weapon systems. You know, it is, it is, that is weapons oriented and to bring it into current times, I think it's, it's interesting. Two things are problems. One thing that is a problem is you, you had asked us, does this continue? The problem is that after the 1970s, 
we literally don't have the data. I mean, it's not the data, ne data never existed at the N National Military Command Center, at NORAD, at Air Force Intelligence. We have no window into it. Hopefully they were collecting it. I don't know that they're saving it. As, as other people have pointed out, you know, they have parameters for what's a threat and what's not a threat. If it doesn't meet the profile, we do know at NORAD things that don't meet the profile just get erased from the tapes. So it makes it very hard for us. And there is no, no sign that there was any official reporting from, for example, the ICBM installations. One of the things we see in 1975 is when the ICBM installations themselves report a national security condition, like they're under threat by these UFOs, regional commands refuse to send interceptors. It's like, wait a minute, hold, hold on. Uh, it's like, I'm sorry, we stopped studying UFOs. So therefore, if you see them over your ICBM base, we're not concerned. That doesn't really play very well, does it? But that makes it difficult going forward. Now, what we see now in contemporary times, I think is interesting because we just saw a congressional hearing. Um, and in that hearing, one of the graphics that was shown was a, a graphic of where they're collecting reports now. And one of the things they noticed noted is it's over areas of military activity. Now, what they didn't tell us is what about areas of military inactivity about all those ICM bases? Wait a minute, do you guys no longer worry about that just because you're not launching them? I, you know, what about over your ballistic missile submarines? You know, they just, okay, there are UAPs over naval uh, deployment and test areas. That That's interesting. And that would, I, I'm personally interested to see, I would love to know if there are any UAP reports over where the hypersonic weapons are being tested yeah. or where the Aegis driven anti-satellite missiles were tested, but we don't know. So again, we have enough of a picture to say, yeah, there may be some ongoing military interest, but the concern is, are they even really studying the big picture? Or are they just doing it? It appears that right now in 2023, we're doing exactly what Blue Book was doing back in 1953, which was taking it a report at a time explaining it or not explaining it, filing it, and then just setting it aside, never looking for any pattern. You know, it's not like the intelligence community knows how to do pattern recognition. I sincerely hope someone somewhere is doing it. <laughs> if so, they're not sharing it. Yeah. Well, fortunately, we have organizations like the FCU that have, you know, I, I, I guess, taken up the torch, so to speak. So... Larry, let me thank you so much for your time today. And again, let me thank you for your service. And I want to close by asking, what comes next for yourself and for the SCU? Uh, you, I think you've already partially answered that. You said that you were working on an intense study. I believe that there, there may also be a conference coming up. What are some of the things that you guys are involved with in 2023? Uh, we we're we have about two more years to go with our basic program. I think we're about we're in our fourth year in progress with this study. So next is to get peer reviewed and publish the intention study. Um, we are going to be delivering a paper on a model for intention study at the upcoming SCU conference that would show our practices and techniques and try to encourage people, other teams, other people to use the same model to stutter, study different aspects of the phenomena. So we are we are doing that, that'll be, come up this summer. And we are also beginning to take a look at some of the other trends and patterns outside of the military domain. I, I mentioned some of those briefly, you know, what, what's happening in the public domain. At, going back to our database and looking at some of the variables and types of incidents, you know, what was being reported by the military versus what was being reported in public. So again, we're we're starting to recycle through the whole pattern recognition and tensions process in the public domain. So that's probably good for at least another two years. Uh, so, you know, five, six years down the road. <laughs> well, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today, sir. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you.